It is official. Hipsters have taken over motorcycles. We were thinking, oh, this would be fun to talk about. There's a bunch of really cool neo retro and modern classic motorcycles out there. Guys, seriously, I don't know if you realize just how many neo retro bikes there are for sale nowadays. Spoiler alert, right off the gate, there are over 40 motorcycles on this list. Yes, some of them come from the same family, meaning that they can be neatly crammed into one entry, but the hipster apocalypse isn't upon us. It's already happened. Now, I have attempted to fit as many of these retro classic motorcycles onto this tier list as possible, but it's like trying to pull out gray hairs. For everyone, you find three more take its place, so if I missed a bike, that doesn't mean it's bad or it's not a neo retro bike, it just means I didn't want to be reading the script until the heat death of the universe. Let's get started. Starting off with the F tier today, literally the only reason to purchase an F tier bike is that they are the last working motorcycle on the planet. There are so many better choices out there, so unless you're all about the bad bike life, then avoid these at all costs. I'm sure you've already guessed our first entry in the F tier, and it's every single Royal Enfield. Yep, we're dunking on old RE again. I know they're a common whipping boy on the channel, but they make modern classic motorcycles in the same way Harley Davidson does, meaning that they just make old motorcycles with the new coat of paint. Stateside, they're currently selling the Interceptor 650, which couldn't intercept fart in a stiff headwind, the Continental GT, which is like a Bonneville from 1965, but with fuel injection, and the Himalayan, which has an inspiring story, but is one of the lamest ADV bikes out right now. They're doing some cool stuff in the world of flat track racing, so when they start selling factory flat track bikes, maybe you'll see a Royal Enfield in a video, or maybe even featured on the channel, but until then, they're gonna stay in the dumpster where they belong. Joining RE in the F tier is the Jixxer 250. Now I know what you're thinking, Papa Yams, that's a modern sport bike. No, it's really not. It's a bike with a cradle frame, a massive front tire, and less power than a donkey with no legs. It's basically the modern incarnation of the Ninja 250, a motorcycle that anyone can hop on, learn how to go, stop, and turn, and then sell for $1,000 on Craigslist and get a proper starter bike. The only thing this bike has going for it over a Ninja 250 is that it has fuel injection. Moving up to the D tier, which is solely populated by the only only other company is stuck in the past is Royal Enfield, Harley Davidson. Harley is the only company out there that just wants to make one kind of motorcycle, and they're so committed to being the cruiser company that they took one of their cool motorcycles, the V-Rod, out behind the barn and unceremoniously shot it in the face. They then wanted to make the Bronx and every single boomer out in the world have their grandkids tweet, hashtag not my Harley for them, and HD backpedaled harder and harder than a politician who just got asked a hard question. And then they were like, okay, we hear you loud and clear. You want heavy, slow, poor handling bikes. Got it. And then they slapped the 114 into the street bob and the entire audience all clapped in unison like the good trained consumers that they are. Look, if you like Harley, that's fine, but there are infinitely better options in the cruiser marketplace right now, and you know there are, so don't worry, we're gonna be talking about them in just a minute. Keeping it rolling in the D tier, we have the Honda Monkey. Basically a Grom, but in a tweed suit. Back in the day, the Monkey was called the CZ100 and the Z50, which were the little bop around town kind of bikes on and off road just to goof off on. And considering that's the entire design philosophy of the Grom, it makes sense that they just slapped some semi nobbies on it and some classic paint, and it was an instant hit. The problem with the Monkey is that it's heavy. The Grom weighs 234 pounds wet and ready to ride because it's all plastic, but the Monkey is closer to 245, and on an air cooled 125, every pound counts. It's also expensive at $3,999 to the Grom's $3,399. But hey, if you looked at a Grom and thought, man, if only I could get a mini bike to match my beard and flannel shirt, then the $600 increase might be worth it. Joining the monkey in the D tier is the BMW R9T line of bikes. R9Ts are sweet rides, but like Harleys, they're old school air-cooled twins, which means that the engine makes 110 horsepower and 86 foot-pounds of torque, but it doesn't really feel like it. If you want a motorcycle that's comfortable, handles well, and looks cool, then all four of the r 19 models make for better cruisers than any Harley. It's not higher on the list because as as a cruiser and as a standard bikes, there are better choices. The R9Ts are also ostensibly scramblers. We took Whitney's R9T Urban GS on some seriously tough dirt roads, and it did great. You might want to slap on a skid plate on there to protect the low-slung exhaust. Next up, we've got the C tier. Every single bike in the C tier is worth a buy. There are a lot of bikes that I consider to be better than these, but no one can say that you bought a bad motorcycle. Basically, they're all the tip of the bell curve. Starting us off, we have dual sport style motorcycles. But yeah, dual sports aren't modern classic. They just never bothered to update them over the last 20 or 30 years and oh, that's exactly what a modern classic is. 
With the exception of the DRZ400, all the modern dual sports have FI, modernish LCD dashes, and some have even rider modes, but they still have the classic dirt bike style looks. I mean, take a look at the 2021 KLR650 next to a 1987 KLR. And sure, there's some cosmetic differences in fuel injection, but the modern KLR is going to be making a vintage 35 horsepower, and it's only going to have five speeds. If you're looking for an old school looking dual sport, pick up any modern bike and slap on an old school graphics kit for like 50 bucks, and you're all set to relive the glory days of the 80s and the 90s. Joining dual sports in the C tier are the Moto Guzzi V7 and V9 bikes. These are basically modern incarnations of the Honda CX series of motorcycles from the 70s, but in line with any good Euro bike manufacturer, they make approximately 450 different models for you to buy. At the core of these bikes are a pair of air-cooled, longitudinally mounted V-twins that make 52 horsepower for the V7 bikes and 55 horsepower for the V9, so pick your poison, you're not really missing much by not getting the V9 in my opinion. One of the biggest reasons why Moto Guzzi's only C tier is while they do have a long history full of accolades and racing successes, nowadays they're mostly just a niche brand. There's a very limited dealer network and modern racing wins are in their own events, so basically it's the motorcycle equivalent of that one meme of Obama giving himself a medal. And also, let's be real, those power figures are pretty pathetic, especially for the V9, and once again, there are so many dang modern classic bikes, there's not really much of an excuse. Next up in the C tier is the Kawasaki W800. In case you're wondering, no, it's not a knockoff Bonneville, even though that's the common line everyone says about the W800. Instead, it's a modern reinterpretation of the W series from the 1960s. These were classic parallel twin UJMs from back when all the big four only made one motorcycle and just slapped different logos on them like KTM and Husqvarna. In much the same way as the Honda CB1100, the W800 was built almost exactly the same way, just with a few updates here and there to make it more livable. It's got fuel injection, disc brakes, and an electronic start, but it makes a vintage 47 horsepower with an 8.4 to 1 compression ratio, so it's not exactly a screamer. They do have a cafe variant with clip-ons, brat seat style, and bubble fairings at the front to complete the look, but the only thing this bike can do is race a Harley, and that's not really saying much. It's also not very much for the price, it's 9199 bucks, but if you're the kind of rider who wants a truly vintage motorcycle without the headache that comes with owning a UJM, then this bike might be for you. Rounding up the C tier, we have the Suzuki Katana. Q trigger Katana fans in the comments section. Why is the Katana not the S tier? Katana's the best. Ugh, K5 motor makes me feel things in my no-no zone. Well, first of all, no, it's not a K5 motor. I'm sorry. Suzuki can claim it's the K5 all they want, but it's basically a modern engine with modern emission regulations and modern fueling, and in that sense, they basically just took the Jixus 1000 and slapped some new bodywork on it. Sure, it's a convincing doppelganger, but aside from the looks, there's nothing old school about it, not to mention it's $13,499, which is MT-10 money. Yes, I know the MT-10 isn't a Neo Retro bike, and this is the most performance-oriented modern classic, but man, if I were to walk into a dealership and I saw the Katana and the MT-10 sitting next to each other, one with the R1's frame and engine, the other with a kneecapped version of the K5 in it, I know which one I'd buy. That or a Busa. That's technically a modern classic, right? Moving on up, we have the B tier. These are our bronze medalists close to the top, but not quite good enough for one reason or another. If you find yourself picking up one of these bikes, you can feel confident that you're picking up a bike that not only nails the Neo Retro vibes, but has some serious performance chops to back it up. First up is the XSR 900, basically an MT-09, but filtered through the lens of craft beer, hand ground coffee beans, and beard wax. It's still the same fire-breathing mill from the MT-09, but it looks a little more pulled together and the stance is a little bit different. We've actually got an entire video coming out later this week comparing the MT-09 and the XSR900, so stay tuned for that one. Joining the XSR900 is Kawasaki's intermediate retro naked, the Z900RS. Back in the day, we made an entire So You Want a Blank video on the Z900, which you should totally go and check out, but to make a long story short, the Z900RS had the same inline 4 as the Z900, but it styled after the Z1900 from the 70s, which was dubbed the New York Strip because it was the biggest and baddest bike coming from Japan. Nowadays, the Z900 platform might not be the fastest thing in the world, but it's still a really sweet bike. It only made sense that when the hipster Apocalypse fell upon us and Team Green slapped a bubble fairing and some pinstripe paint on there and sold the bike at a premium. I know we bring it up every time we talk about the Z900RS, but it's one of the only modern classic bikes coming from Japan with the dual analog tack and speedo, which might seem like a small thing, but it is so cool watching the needle spin when you hop on the throttle. For that reason alone, I'm tempted to say that it's better than an XSR900, but then again, that XSR is a triple and Papa Yams does love himself a triple. I'm gonna need to meditate on that one. Next up in the B tier, 
here is the entire Ducati Scrambler line. Yes, I have a Scrambler. Yes, I love it. Yes, they are really worth being up high on this list. While they are not as performance oriented as the XSR and Z900 RS, they make a perfectly adequate 75 horsepower and 50 foot pounds of torque, which is better than the Guzzi's, and they have a velvety smooth V-twin with all the pops and crackles you'd want, which makes it better than an inline four any day of the week. Not to mention the Ducati Scramblers are actually competent scramblers. Sure, they don't have all the desert sleds, ground clearances, but we took a Scrambler icon down the road it had no business being on, and it performed admirably. Of course, most people just use them as a platform to make some sort of half-assed cafe racer and then park out in front of a coffee shop, but that's besides the point. If you want a classic-looking bike that makes a great sound and can tackle a light trail or two, then look no further than a Ducati Scrambler. Finally, in the B tier is the Indian Scout. It's what Harley wishes their Sportster was, a classic-looking classic sounding motorcycle that goes like stink. Sure it handles a little weird and the brakes don't work all that well and the chunky front tire means it limits your options for better rubber, but that's the sort of thing you want out of a muscle cruiser and a classic styled bike. When you ride a Scout, you feel like a proper real boy, not one of those people you see in a Harley ad, but the kind of person who cruises down the open road looking for the horizon. Yes, there are some cruisers with more torque and more retro looks, but the Scout as a package is just what I was looking for out of an American motorcycle. Now for the A tier. These are some of the best motorcycles on the road. If you're on the fence at all about buying one of these, just go for it. And starting us out is the XSR 700. Wait, why is a slower bike higher up on the list than the faster bike, Yams? Because it's actually more fun. The MT-07 versus MT-09 is a classic case of more not always being better, and it's the same for the XSRs. The 700 has an absolutely awesome little parallel twin, which has that 270 degree crank, so it sounds way better than basically any other 650. It's got more more of a modding scene because it's a super simple motorcycle and it's lightweight so you can flick it around a twisty road no problem. Yeah, it's not the most capable Canyon Carver, but if you're thinking about picking up an XSR 900, I strongly urge you to give the XSR 700 a good long look first. Sticking with the Japanese 650s, we've got the SV650X. This one's high up on the list because it's an SV650. You can do whatever you want with an SV650. The X is a prettier version, so they took a great bike and made it a little bit better. Moving on, the last A tier bike is the CB650R from Honda. This bike is an absolute sweetheart with a punchy engine, modern reliability, and just enough retro styling so that you can feel comfortable riding around in a Biltwell Gringo and leather driver's gloves. Admittedly, the CB650R is more neo than retro, but it's a classic design that will age very well. It also helps that it's one of the most potent 650s on the market, making 80 horsepower, though it does have a weird flat spot in the torque curve, which you can only fix with the tune and ECU flash. I'd say this bike is more for a young professional than a hipster, but it's definitely got an old school flair. Rounding things out are the S tier, the creme de la creme of the retro bikes. They have everything you'd want out of a retro bike, but set you apart from the crowd. And let's start out with perhaps the most obvious choice, Triumph's Bonneville line. These bikes are phenomenal. We've had one in the shop for this round of the beginner bike giveaway, and it's one of the bikes that I just keep coming back to time and time again. It's comfortable, the throttle fuel is sublime, and the engine note is one of a kind. The best part about it is you can get it in just about any flavor. If you want a cruiser, get the Speedmaster. If you want a sport bike, get the Thruxton. If you want an adventure bike, get the Scrambler XE. It's retro done right and with bits that look like they're off of the old models, but an engine that you can tell was made after 2015. The 900s make more than enough power to have fun with, and they make a 1200 if you're insecure in your masculinity or you want the Scrambler model. These bikes are an icon for a reason, and if you're thinking about picking one up, don't sleep on it. They are every bit as good as you think they are. And last bike on the list is probably one you're not expecting. It's the MV Agusta Super Veloce, a bike that puts the racer in Cafe Racer. A tribute to the sport bikes of yore, styled after the bubble fairing bikes that ran the Isle of Man back in the 70s. It's got smooth, rounded lines, which is something of an oddity among MVs. From the single round headlight and taillight to the exposed frame and even the stock round bar end mirrors, this bike is gorgeous from every angle, but it goes like a stabbed rat. It's putting down almost 150 horsepower out of its 798cc triple. With top spec components from stem to stern, if you want to flex on all your friends at the cafe and pass them at your local track, this is the best bike for the job. Of course I had to pick something like this as an S tier. Fact! At the Gettysburg reunion in 1913, two men purchased a hatchet, walked to the site where their regiments had fought, and buried it. Goodbye. You've made it to the end of a Yami Noob video. Did you like what you saw? Do you want to see more of it? Check it out, right here, just like magic, waiting for you. Click this little square, right here. More memes, more yammy, more of my face. Isn't that great?